Hi, everyone. I'm Gary Berman, the host of the Cyber Hero Adventure Show. And we have a special edition of the Cyber Hero Network Book Club today. And so we're just going to jump right into meeting some of the coolest people that you're going to listen and learn from about all types of cybersecurity related topics. We're beginning with Herb Reichblatt. Hey, Herb, how are you doing? Hey, Gary, I'm doing fine. How are you? So glad to uh, have you on the show today. Um, your new book uh, is going to just uh, blow people away. And you just had a very uh, uh, interesting and excellent review from uh, MIT Press. Uh, algorithms uh, are not enough. And, and uh, stay tuned. We'll be jumping into that as soon as we say hi to Bill Holstein. Hey, Bill. Hi. Thanks so much uh, uh, for being here. My pleasure, as always. Okay. It's always fun and interesting being with you. Thank you so much. Um, well, it's all about you, actually, is why this is so interesting. Um, so we're going to be learning a, a lot more about uh, China and what's going on and um, what the future holds. So that's going to be super cool. Um, speaking of super cool, uh, Dr. Chase Cunningham. Hey, Chase. Howdy. And uh, before the show, he had on his name there. Uh, can I say it out loud or not? I did, you know. Yeah. He, he, he branded himself Dr. Zero Trust, which sounds like a ridiculously great superhero uh, <laughs> kind of uh, a character. So should we trust anything, you know, we're about to uh, hear from you or what? Absolutely not. Okay. Thanks for the integrity of saying that. <laughs> Speaking of uh, in integrity, uh, Scott Shelber. Hey, Scott, how you doing? Hey, doing good. Good to see you there, Gary. And great to be here with these other awesome authors. Thank you so much. Indeed. And, and Scott, uh, like uh, some of you have written uh, multiple books, and we're going to be learning um, all about uh, some of the demographic as aspects of cybersecurity, uh, uh, senior cyber. Um, and uh, uh, Scott is so clever, he even had large font inside, uh, uh, inside the book. Uh, that's understanding your, your target market for sure. Um, so uh, let's uh, uh, jump right into this, and uh, uh, let's begin with uh, you, Herb. And uh, in full disclosure, uh, Herb uh, just was kind enough to become an official advisor of the Cyber Hero Network. Um, are you bored or what? <laughs> uh, quite the opposite. Uh, it's an opportunity to, to promote what we're trying to do. Um, you know, I mean, the book is about artificial intelligence and uh, the Cyber Hero Network is about cybersecurity. So I'm working to bring what I know and, and about artificial intelligence to try to do some good for cybersecurity. I really like what you've been doing and, and what you've been leading in all of this. And that's why I wanted to be an advisor because we're making it accessible. We're making it personal. We're making it uh, available to people in ways, for example, that Scott's book does that, um, Nobody else is really doing. We're either talking to ourselves in a deep technical way or we're leaving people scared and in the dust. Uh, whereas what we should really be doing is, is, is helping people to be cybersecurity uh, practitioners, even if they're not uh, cybersecurity professionals. Well, uh, that's what we have to say about that. Um, and uh, you know, uh, speaking uh, of advisors, uh, uh, Scott, I, am I okay to to make an uh, announcement right now? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm happy to welcome our our next uh, advisor to the Cyber Hero Networks, uh, Scott Chober. And Scott and I uh, originally met because um, we had a rather unfortunate uh, experience in, in common in. in uh, uh, previous life. Um, tell us about that, Scott. How did you get to this moment? Yeah, well, it really was the, the culmination of, I guess, my, my first book. I wasn't planning to be a writer or writing a book, but my company was targeted and hacked a number of years ago, which led to Hacked Again. And I share my story of getting compromised, which is kind of a little bit embarrassing. But uh, if I share my story and the mistakes I've made, hopefully people won't go down that same path that, that I've gone down. And that's kind of what I've been doing, and which led to my second book, Cybersecurity is Everybody's Business, making it a little bit more personal for small business owners. And then more recently, I launched this year uh, Senior Cyber to, to target that niche audience of seniors that I kind of felt were underserved and intimidated with, with cybersecurity. So um, it's been an interesting journey. And I have found that writing books, and I'm sure these other authors will, will probably agree, it opens the door up to so many other things. But the exciting part is that 
We're all taking part of something where we're educating and sharing information so people can be safer and not live in fear. And at the same time, with great platforms like your show, Gary, it can be fun, too. It doesn't have to be deer in the headlights, all ones and zeros and super techie. It, it could be a nice balance where you could still have fun. You could learn things, but you could still stay safe and, and be on the Internet and use computers and smart devices. Indeed. And, and speaking of fun, uh, so Chase, I was so glad uh, you know that you're here. And um, so you've written uh, something very, very interesting, just released, I think, in the last couple of weeks. Um, tell us uh, about it. Yeah, so I, uh, I, I wrote a novel, um, and I, this is book number five or six for me. Um, and really the crux of this was taking sort of stuff that I was affiliated with in the military, the things I know about artificial intelligence, cyber warfare, and schlepping it all together and having some sort of a interesting narrative and then hopefully getting people to understand that there's um there's a there's a need for more people in the space which is one one thing and then the other is that there is a reality of what's going on with artificial intelligence and cyber warfare and cyber crime and this is what it actually might look like not the Chris Hemsworth black cat you know super hot guy typing on a keyboard thing yeah, I did. Um, and you also have a, a big commitment to diversity and inclusion, particularly women in cybersecurity. Yeah, I pushed, uh, I, I tried to push that out because a lot of people aren't aware of a lot of the, the real value that we get from people uh, that are not just, you know, like myself, the stereotypical uh, ex military person in cyber. Like we've, um, a lot of folks have never heard of uh, heroes like Shannon Kent and other, other people that have done the deed given the sacrifice, uh, paid their dues in cyber. And honestly, this was just my humble attempt at trying to give them a fair shake and get folks to put eyes on glass that this is a, there's a broader, uh, there's a broader field of people out here that can, that can help with the mission. In, indeed. And uh, speaking of uh, mission, uh, Bill Holstein, you've had uh, a long and storied uh, career with a very, very uh, important focus, which is China. So tell us uh, your origin story about that. Well, I, I, would, I was a young man on the foreign desk of United Press International, and I would have gone anywhere in the world. I just wanted to get a transfer anywhere. I wanted to go to South Africa or Paris. But one day the phone rang and said, Bill, we need you in Hong Kong. Jimmy Carter and Deng Xiaoping were normalizing relations, so my lords and masters realized they needed to throw young flesh into the, into the region. So uh, I happened to be present then for the birth of modern U.S.-Chinese relations uh, while serving in Hong Kong and studying the language and serving in Beijing. And that started me on a lifetime of involvement, fascination with the China story and our engagement with China. And then uh, uh, later I started specializing in technology coverage when I worked for U.S. News and World Report after working for Business Week. So, uh, so I've, I've combined these two fields of, of fascination of interest, China and technology, because I think that gives me an, an edge in understanding what their global strategy is behind their 5G telecommunications uh, uh, technology and their role in AI and their uh, what their ambitions are. And, I, and further, I think uh, that I'm, I have something to offer when it comes to how can the world respond? How, what, what can we Americans be doing about this hugely ambitious Chinese effort to dominate the world technologically. So that's the long, that's the short version of my, of my long history. Wow, indeed. And it's um, as topical uh, as, uh, as ever. Uh, you may know, may right I ask now. my colleagues a, a question? Is my, my fire away and my journalistic instincts? I'm hearing that, that AI is being used in some of the cyber attacks uh, is that true? Are, are we, are, are, is our computer system on the receiving end of computer attack, attacks being generated by artificial intelligence? Chase, go ahead and talk about it. Oh, Herb, Herb's the man. I'm actually, I literally just ordered your book right now. So, like, you, you. Oh, you, thank you. <laughs> oh, good. I'm moving up the bestseller list. I'm not a senior, and I bought Scott's book, so I have a large French book to read as well. <laughs> well, well, wait, just uh, for members of our audience, we now have some empirical data that being part of the Cyber Hero Network and the book club generates sales. Yay! I doubled my sales for the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, so oh. my, my, my position on that would be uh, we've skewed the the narrative on what artificial intelligence actually is, right? We have people, and I, I, I was just watching a report this morning on AI and cyber and blah, blah, blah. It's not AI. And uh, number one, we don't want AI because that's a very dangerous thing. Like nuclear weapons and artificial intelligence and viruses now for because of 2020 scare the heck out of me. Um, but we don't have AI. We have machine learning powered systems that have a lot of process and compute that are being aimed at a variety of things to cause an outcome. But it's not AI. And honestly, we do ourselves a disservice and we do promote FUD by talking about AI in the space. Uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding about AI. And, and uh, at one level, uh, Chase is uh, absolutely right. I mean, there's no uh, human brain inside of a box that's running things. Um, most of it is very task oriented, very specific in the sense of let's try to figure out uh, something. Uh, the, the, there, there are names I cannot mention because I have the machines and they will wake up and want to know what I'm asking them for. But there are lots of machines in, in my office here that if you ask them a question, they'll find an answer for it. Now, that's not general artificial intelligence. That is some specific artificial intelligence. And, and people argue about whether it's artificial intelligence or not, but, but in my book, it, it's, it's, uh, it's narrow artificial intelligence. It's in use. It's in use uh, in defense uh, against, uh, against intrusions. Um, but a lot of it as, I mean, Chase isn't wrong when he says machine learning is just banging away at everything. The problem is machine learning doesn't get tired. It doesn't get distracted. It doesn't take vacations. It just works. And if they can, most of the, most of the attacks that we see nowadays are actually uh, very simple minded. They buy an attack framework from somebody and they run it and they're easy to identify and they usually fail, but it's okay because they're cheap. Um, but there are actors going on, uh, participating now that weren't participating say five years ago that don't really care how cheap it is. They don't really care if they make money. What they care about is getting data that they can that they can use for lots of different reasons. Selling it sometimes, appearing to sell it sometimes, or just creating chaos. Those are the guys who are, are most frighteningly using uh, what I call artificial intelligence. Chase may call man eh, nothing but machine learning, but we're talking about the same thing. Indeed, indeed. I think similar to that in a little bit different spin, maybe. And I kind of call it machine learning. Typically, uh, we focus more on the hardware side. So we're selling to DOD agencies, wireless threat detection tools, analyzing different characteristics of the way signals propagate, where they could be a potential threat or conduit to get into a secure space. And so a lot of our algorithms that we're de developing kind of have this learning capability and I usually will classify it machine learning most people in the industry will just generic and say oh it's artificial intelligence not exactly but but it does have the ability to learn and adapt as the situation changes the algorithm will change and automatically adjust as the threat conditions change so I, I think that what's happened with artificial intelligence at least from my my space more on the media side it's a buzzword that's been accepted and that's what they want to use, especially to maybe Bill's point uh, in, in the race for artificial intelligence. U.S. and China are back and forth. Who's in the, in the race? Who's in the lead? Who's got more investment, more patent, so on and so forth. So that buzzword has really taken off in the world of media and kind of been coined, whether it be learning, modeling, machine learning or true artificial intelligence. And, and so, Bill, um, so now you have, you know, some uh, very informed opinions about this. How does this map with your perception? Well, um, it's, it's my view that the Chinese have, uh, have increased their sophistication dramatically. I mean, they've, they've now launched, they've put somebody on the moon, put a, a vessel on the moon, at the, uh, excuse me, on Mars at the same time that we were. Their technological capabilities have exploded. So I, I, I believe that as part of their Belt and Road Initiative, part of their digital uh, Silk Road Initiative, that they are attempting to use Huawei and other means of telecommunications to, to hardwire the world for data. And that then they take this data and they build dossiers of people that they're interested in 
or institutions that they're interested in, and then they can take action on the basis of what they know about where our technologies are, what our decision-making processes are. I, I, I fear that they have they have become more sophisticated than than we understand, and that we we urgently need to. Uh, achieve a, a strategy to respond because so far we haven't. As Americans, we have not really uh, said this is something we need to work on. Microsoft, come in and let's have a conversation. Apple, come in, let's talk. Amazon Web Services, you guys come in, let's talk about what your profiles are in China. Or have you been penetrated in China? Microsoft, you know, gave away its source code. So it's, op- it's, a, it's a Windows operating system years ago, years ago. So uh, we need to have our American companies working with American security agencies and American government to create a, a, uh, a strategy so that we're not being picked apart and that we can maintain and develop our own technologies rather than having them uh, being siphoned off and going off to being developed at, at shadow laboratories on, on the mainland. So we have a lot of work to do, uh, but it, it starts, I think, with recognizing the pattern of what's happened. Indeed. That's that's the key there, Bill. I want to emphasize that. It's the recognition part. I don't think anybody in this country is really paying attention. Hmm. I mean, I, I, when I say I don't think anybody, I, I'm exaggerating, but but the people who ought to be paying attention to that, I think, are not. And it's got nothing to do with China. It could be, it, it, I mean, North Korea scares me a lot because they don't care about making a profit. They care about creating chaos. Right. Um, and um, there are lots of opportunities that we are just going along blindly ignoring uh, that that really frighten me. Well, there are p- people in the security apparatus and the intelligence apparatus, certainly in the mil- American military, who have uh, eyes wide open about all this. Uh, but the problem is they're not be- they're not able to persuade uh, corporate leaders or Wall Street. Or, or many other sectors of our sprawling democracy that they should take it seriously. So many people, yeah, people in Silicon Valley and Wall Street want to continue business as usual. Well, and we see that in the supply chain. I mean, we've got very efficient supply chains, uh, but we also found out that they're incredibly brittle. Right. And uh, and it's the same thing with these, with artificial intelligence. It may be efficient to do business today in the way we're doing business, but it's going to come back. And, and so, um, uh, Chase, you have a very unique perch. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, uh, you probably can't disclose uh, too much, but can uh, you share with our audience, you know, your feedback on what you're hearing so far? Well, I, I think they're a thousand percent right. Like in the, when you look at what's going on with China, um, there's actually a really great paper that was written by a, a, a colonel that retired on uh, kind of how they're, They've been they were forced to take the measures they've taken to progress in the space. And I mean, I've read everything Bill's written and I, I think his stuff is amazing. So like the line on on how this all goes forward and where it lines up. I mean, we're in a race with these other uh, countries to try and do more. Um, and honestly, it's uh, there. There's been some master strokes over the last couple of years that have put other countries in a power position and we're scrambling to catch up. And the longer we scramble because of things like artificial intelligence and these types of capabilities means you begin to lose faster. Um, so that that honestly is what worries me. Uh, and I mean, I don't stay awake at night because I I'm not going to you know sweat bullets over something that I can't deal with. But I mean, the reality of the situation is um, this is national level. This is big, big time. And the fact that we do have interest in collaboration and coordination with a nation that is openly adversarial towards us should be concerning. Yeah, indeed. And, um, and Scott, I, I'm sure you're, you know, well aware of um, the uh, recent um, uh, changes over at uh, CISA, um, you know, in terms of leadership and at the White House. And um, I uh, happen to have watched the Senate hearings uh, about that. And I came away optimistic. Um, what's your pulse of, of how we're looking at, at all this now. Yeah, I think it is more optimistic now. I kind of concur with that. If, if I go back just a few years ago, I did a number of different segments and a lot of research on China versus U.S. and the race in the world of AI. And it was back and forth, 
and, and China really looked like overall from a statistical standpoint, they're going to take the edge because the conversation didn't seem to be happening here. Enough leaders didn't really pay attention to it and kind of it, it dovetails on some of the points you guys already mentioned there. It, it does seem like the conversation is happening now and things are being discussed here in the U.S. and they're making better efforts and they're investing in it. And, and it's a very different culture, obviously, in China. The government is surely behind it. I think the AI and the push, so they're heavily investing over there in China. That has to happen more, I think, here in the United States. Not just people talking about it, but, but really the government getting behind some money behind it to make it happen. And I think with that, then the U.S. will certainly take the lead in AI. Right now, it's still to me, it's, it's kind of a 50-50 battle going back and forth. But China is certainly acquiring a lot more of the intellectual property. And I think somebody looking forward, that's what's going to allow them to really grow in that area, depending upon where they're applying it. But most of it toward military uh, type of things, it could be very concerning from a, a national security perspective. So the U.S. does have to up its game, I think, immediately. Indeed. And uh, Bill, I, I'm sure you're well familiar with the uh, phrase, uh, the whole of nation approach. Right. right. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, I, I certainly advocate that, that we we need to over, overcome our uh, our differences among our different sectors, for example, public sector versus the private sector. We don't agree. Here's here's one one footnote that strikes me as sort of insane. The Pentagon has 300,000 co companies that supply it. And so the defense industrial base. And so the Chinese, I know because I've talked to people who experienced this, are starting to work their way into the lower levels of the defense industrial base by penetrating up the ladder, so to speak. The guys at the top, like the Raytheons and Lockheeds, they, they're pretty sophisticated, but they're, the, the underlying that is the, the Chinese are, are moving in. But the Pentagon does not have the legal authority to look into the systems of its suppliers to see if it can identify any state actors. Can, so imagine that the Pentagon is depending on 300,000 companies to supply it with the things it needs, but it doesn't know for sure what foreign company, uh, countries or governments might be involved in those companies. So that's the kind of thing where we don't we don't cooperate. We, our Pentagon and our civilian sector can't cooperate. We, we can't find a way to be cohesive in the face of this external challenge. Well, uh, just to uh, provide some a little bit of optimism about that, Jan Easterly, the new uh, right. director over at CISOM, um, is all about uh, uh, public-private partnerships. And uh, she's full steam ahead on on uh, on that. So and Chris English is a national cyber czar. He's a he's a steady hand and a good voice, a good influence. So yes, the Biden administration is putting in place some of the policies or executive orders, for example, and some of the people. Uh, but uh, they have they have a long road ahead of them. Yeah, indeed. And so let's um, dive in now, uh, Chase, um, about uh, your book. Um, can you share with our, our audience uh, the, the motivation and, uh, and the story? Is it, is it fiction? Is it nonfiction? The narrative is a fiction. Um, it's, it's basically a story about a, a, a young woman who was doing work with the uh, sort of more tactical side of the U.S. government, um, winds up working specifically for the national security agency and doing a bunch of work on that side. And on the fall on the other side, um, there's a, uh, a research project, an artificial intelligence um, entity that uh, the government had the bright idea to just kind of let it figure out what it liked and train itself. And it happened to like uh, uh, incredibly uh, divisive biblical text and horror movies. And it took the two and combined them. And then it, the sides who it doesn't like um so that's kind of the way that it goes down and she's tasked with uh defending um us from this from this entity as it kind of goes rogue and does what it does wow that sounds uh interesting and and the lead character is uh female you i think you said yeah her name's violet yep wow, so far no one's actually put it together that her initials spell vm which i thought was kind of funny because i'm a technology nerd and i was like vm haha -ha, but yeah <laughs> Yeah, no, that, that's cool. And uh, how uh, would our audience get a copy of your book? Uh, it's on Amazon right now um, is the easiest way to get it. I'm working on getting it on some other, uh, uh, you know, venues. But right now, Amazon primarily is it. And uh, the title of your book? 
Gabriel. Um, I've had a lot of people look at it and go, oh, C colon slash Gabriel. No, it's just Gabriel. That's a C prompt. So, you know. Gabriel. Okay, cool. And uh, uh, we'll um, have uh, pictures of every of your books, uh, you know, in the uh, final version of uh, the show. Um, so, uh, Scott, uh, what prompted you to uh, do a demographically focused book and, and what's the title of it? Yeah, uh, Senior Cyber came about more as a frustration. I, at the time, my, my grandfather was 99 years old and he was still very, very busy with technology, Apple devices and iPads. He's a ham operator his entire life. So he's very technical. He worked at Bell Labs for 40 plus years before he retired, worked on some of the first satellites, the Telstar and other projects. Um, so he, he was frustrated trying to use technology and, and he was a big trader of stocks. So he always wanted to get on each day and buying and selling his stocks and had a lot of problems with passwords, logging credentials, remembering things as, as you could expect when you're 99 years old. Um, so I found that often when I would visit him each week, I was sharing little tips and tricks, trying to keep him safe. And at the same time, he was targeted by a couple scammers, both phone scammers, email scammers, things in, in the mail. It, it didn't end. So anyway, in the process of all that, I was trying to help him. And then also my parents, who are, who are now a little bit older and having some health conditions with computers, passwords, the same thing. So I said, geez, there's got to be a better way than me spending my time each weekend trying to help and assist them. Let me do some research. Let me find a video. Let me find a book. There wasn't a lot out there that talked to seniors specifically. And the, the few things that I did find out there, I started reading and I said, geez, this is kind of condescending. It's almost a little insulting at treating them like they're their children and, and it didn't empower them at all. It felt a little bit more like you can't do this. So I said, I got to change this. I said, let me write about this and write specifically to that audience of seniors from the experience I had and go out there and actually interview seniors and ask them their likes, their dislikes, what technology they do use, why they don't use it. So kind of getting into their mind a little bit and understanding their frustrations as they age but yet also benefit from the wisdom they have from all the years of, of, of being on this planet and using the transitions in different decades of technology. So kind of combining all of that allowed me to attack it. And, and as was mentioned, I, uh, I appreciate what, what Herb said and what you said earlier there by trying to address the audience, larger font, simple illustrations, any unfamiliar terms that, that would come along the way, I would stop and define it on the spot. Um, and make it fun. I, I tie it in. I also have an activity book with crossword puzzles and word searches and other things that seniors can enjoy. But everything that's easy to read, easy to understand and, and easy to remember. And hopefully they can share it with others. And that's what I'm finding. The feedback is people that are reading it saying, hey, I, you know, I have to share this with my grandfather or my next door neighbor. Or I'm going to bring right. this down to the library and help at a senior center, whatever. So a lot of it's sharing of education and tips to me is is fulfilling that is what i was my goal was in writing the book and that's what i'm seeing so i'm really grateful for the for that feedback and hearing it to this point and i can tell you firsthand it works because uh i talked to my mom about it and I, I think i sent you a photo mm -hmm. uh yep. with, with my mom who's 93 uh so mission accomplished keep up the great work and, and i need it i need it <laughs> <laughs> we'll get you a copy bill after this just shoot me your postal right. address Oh, good. We've had a 100% increase in sales already from one yeah. to two. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, Bill, uh, tell our audience the, the title of uh, your most recent book. It's called A Grand Strategy, colon, Countering China, Taming Technology, and Restoring the Media. It's, it, in part, it's autobiographical. I tell about my adventures in Afghanistan and in the early days of China, uh, chasing the KGB and in Xinjiang and playing Monopoly with the KGB agents in Beijing. So I, I have some of those stories in there to make it interesting. But the, I, I realized in writing it uh, that I, I wanted to make statements of, uh, about things today, issues today. So I went back and I cut out a lot of the personal detail and tried to, to get faster to the punchlines about how we need to create a strategy to deal with China. We don't really have one. Uh, how we need to involve our technology companies in that strategy. Many people in America think China is one set of issues and, and big tech is another set of issues, but they're related. I mean, we need to enlist big tech in 
uh, helping us manage the Chinese emergence. We also uh, need to restore the qual quality of our media, quality of our national discussion. And again, the tech giants are part of that problem because of the prevalence of social media, which we've seen lead to bizarre acts like the insurrection on January 6th. So these relations, these issues are all related to each other. And so I, I start off by telling my, some of my life story, but in the end, I'm trying to offer Americans a, a, a vision of, of ways these different issues fit together and how we can manage our way forward, hopefully to a happy conclusion. Indeed. And how do people get a hold of copy of your book? Well, it's also on Amazon. Uh, and so the key thing to my fellow authors is getting, uh, getting the reviews. I have 25 five-star reviews. And once you get that many reviews, the algorithms on Amazon kick in and they start promoting your book. So get everyone you know to give you a five-star review on Amazon. And you'll see when you get to 25 of them that Amazon starts promoting it by putting you adjacent to other similar books. So once again, the algorithms are in charge. Wow, that's a uh, great segue to um, Herb, uh, the title of your book, Herb. Oh, you're on mute. Yeah. Uh, the dog was barking. Um, oh. the, the title is Algorithms Are Not Enough. Um, and the reason for that is uh, algorithms are very specific steps that, uh, that a computer takes where if the input uh, is right, the output's going to be right. Um, but uh, intelligence requires one to take chances, to do things that can't be proved correct. And sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. But uh, I think the biggest barrier to general artificial intelligence right now is that we're trying to make everything into uh, a mathematical proof. Uh, and that's just not the way things work. May I ask you a question, Herb? In sure. China, in China, they are starting to look at the algorithms and that of different companies. They're they're intervening in what uh, companies do with their algorithms. Is that is that is that practical? Can, could we demand that Facebook and uh, uh, Google, uh, YouTube reveal what their algorithms are doing and how, how they're proving to be so div divisive? Is that is that real That's world or is that fantasy? Uh, it's really a great question, and I think that a lot of our um, uh, leader, legislative leaders, for example, think that that's the way to go. Facebook recently announced that they would be very happy to have people look at their algorithm. I think you aren't going to find out anything important from looking at the algorithm. What matters is what's the outcome. I mean, the, the problem with, with Facebook right now is that they choose to recommend things that are that they know are harmful. So that's why the headlines read, it's a cigarette moment for, for Facebook. Big that, tobacco, that, right? But tobacco, yeah. Um, but 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 the bigger thing is if you just look at the algorithm, you may not really be able to to get anything from it. What matters is what they do, not really how they do it. Hmm. Wow, that's interesting. Um, as we're starting to wrap up here, Herb, do you have any uh, final thoughts you'd like to amplify? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that we've talked a lot about the context of national security and the context of intelligence. Um, Chase mentioned that in his book, uh, it's, a, uh, it's, it's a Terminator trope where some artificial intelligence becomes a true artificial intelligence and... In, in, basically uh, is uncontrollable. Uh, if we go along the paths we're on now, that just isn't going to happen. So in that sense, Chase is absolutely right. There is no artificial intelligence, not in that, certainly not in that sense. And we have to change things a lot for it to be there. Uh, the bigger idea is that when we try to regulate artificial intelligence now, mostly, most of the regulations are about privacy and uh, they're about the outcomes of things. They're not about the artificial intelligence itself. You could replace those words with any other words and the laws would be equally applicable because they're really about protecting people and about privacy. They're not at all about how it's achieved. Wow, that's interesting. Uh, Chase, um, is there uh, anything else you'd like to amplify? 
I, I just uh, think we've got a lot of really good ground we've covered here. Um, I, you know, I think that in my in my opinion, the most important thing that we should be collectively dealing with is keeping things grounded in reality and making sure that people understand the truth of the matter um, and staying ahead of the media spin and all the other shenanigans that kind of show up in the space. So, I mean, I personally, like I dedicate myself daily to that and I, I applaud the the guys on this call and all the other folks that do happen to listen. Like that's what we should be doing. Um, Cause you know, the machines shouldn't win. <laughs> Indeed. And uh, Scott, you're nodding your head in agreement. Yeah, I think it's so true. And, and I do spend a lot of time in the world of media and I think Chase is right. There's so much of it that I've personally seen between different networks and platforms that is controlled, manipulated, and there's a lot of misinformation out there and, and still people believe in it. People listen to it and accept it as fact just because it's on their TV screen, on their computer, on their smart device. And I just encourage people, do your own research, educate yourself. I, I think it, it's a nice, the, the way, Gary, that you brought in here, four different books by obviously different authors covering different areas of cybersecurity, which tells me there's so much diversity in cybersecurity, so many different things we can learn regardless of where we are in our life. And the important thing is that we're constantly all learning. We're sharing information and learning and applying these things so we can implement these best practices, so we can stay safe, so we can beat the machines, we can beat the cyber criminals, so we can fight back. And at the same time, it can be fun. It doesn't have to be a boring thing that's left to the tech guys or the guys wearing hoodies. We're all part of this and can be part of a solution. Indeed. And uh, Bill, you'll have the, the last word. Well, I, I, I agree with everything that Scott just said that that uh, and, and your contribution, Gary, is not insignificant by creating a platform where we can have these kinds of discussions, which you can't really have on ABC, CBS or CNN. So um, I, I think that the right thing is for all of us to keep learning, uh, keep talking. Uh, keep striving to explain this strange new world to people so that they can understand it and take action. I'm sorry, my, my phone is going off. It must be the Chinese. <laughs> In, indeed. Well, on that note, on behalf of a grateful digital universe, uh, thanks to you, Herb, and Chase, and Bill, and Scott for who you are and what you do and why you do it. Um, you uh, have inspired me, and uh, we also have an inspirational uh, mission right now. Uh, we're uh, collaborating with the National Mission for Cybersecurity Education, uh, NICE, as part of NIST. Uh, for the uh, October 18th through 23rd uh, Cybersecurity Career Awareness Week, where we're uh, giving uh, children K through 12 the opportunity to submit original artwork about what they envision a career uh, or a job in cybersecurity is, uh, because uh, you can never start uh, too early. And from everything uh, that we've uh, learned here today, um, you know, this is uh, not going away. Um, so again, on, on behalf of um, a grateful digital universe, thanks so much and have a great day. Right. Thank thanks. you. Stay safe, all. <laughs>